Our scripture this morning is from the 15th chapter of Luke, starting at verse 11. Hear these words. Then he said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided them his livelihood, and not many days after, the younger son gathered it all together and journeyed to a far-off country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all that he had, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his feet fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that he, he, the swines ate, but no one gave him anything. Let us pray together. God, we hear your story. We hear your word. Speak to us so that you may speak through us, not just in our lips, but in our lives. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Last week, Pastor Charlie introduced us to two new diseases that cannot be cured at the Barnabas Health Center. They were affluenza and credititis. And I think some of us were scratching ourselves, feeling a little bit of guilt over having come down with those two diseases. The root behind both of them is a disordered life, a struggle of our priorities and our human inclination to pursue a life dedicated to acquiring possessions rather than following after the God who gives us everything we need. And so this week, we take our next step forward and say, so what does that life look like if we properly order our lives? And the story of the prodigal son provides us an example of what this looks like and what this could look like for us in our lives. The story starts with a man with two sons, and the second makes an interesting and scandalous request of his father. Asking for his inheritance early reveals two things about the son. The first is that he wants what he wants now. This desire for instant gratification is certainly not unique to him, is it? It is a pervasive part of our culture, one that is easily seen when you log on to your Amazon Prime account and say, yes, I want that free day shipping, or maybe I'm going to pay a little extra and I can get it today. That's the craziest thing, is that you can get it same day. It's, it's amazing, but that's what we do. We want things now, don't we? The second is that it reveals that his priorities are not about his family, they're about himself, that he has centered his life, he has centered his whole being around what he wants. And so he takes that, leaves his family, leaves his culture, goes to a far off land to do what he wants to do, to live a life centered around his immediate desires. And we see how that works for him. Scripture says that he lives this life full of prodigal living, squandering his possessions with, desolute, with a dissolute lifestyle. The word squander there is a particularly interesting one. The Greek word, which is challenging to pronounce in the best of times, describes the image of scattering whatever you have aimlessly and without purpose. So it's like he's just sort of throwing his money around, not thinking about where it's going, just doing whatever he wants to do. And the word dissolute living is one that is full of connotations and appropriately vague so we can put whatever we imagine might be happening in that scenario on to that situation. And so the son wanders around doing whatever he wants, spending however he sees fit, and then the crisis happens. The famine comes and his credit line runs out. And it is at this point that that younger son wished he lived 2,000 years later when there were credit cards that would have allowed him to keep living that same lifestyle. Can you imagine this story in today's time? A boy doing whatever he wants, living the good life, not thinking about his possessions, and when he reaches the end of his bank account, is able to keep going past the end digging himself deeper and deeper into a hole that is hard to find your way out of. 
unfortunately for him, the end of the road comes at zero. But for so many people in our culture, and I imagine so many of you, the rock bottom is a negative number and the hole exponentially more challenging to get out of. The financial crisis that happens isn't necessarily because of a famine. Sometimes it comes from a health crisis, an unexpected problem with your house, a layoff at work, or a storm that hits. And then all of a sudden you thought things were going well and then they turn a corner very quickly. And you ask yourself, how did I get into this scenario? I didn't live an extravagant lifestyle. I wasn't throwing huge parties. Because the reality is that we get ourselves into trouble in the small things in life. We get ourselves into trouble by the extra meal we eat, the extra car we buy, the slightly nicer jacket or that extra book or magazine. It's the extras we add on that we don't need that get us into the most trouble in the end. And so Adam Hamilton in his book, Enough, describes two main money wasters that are typical for our time and our culture. The first is that impulse buying, and the second is the reality of how often we eat out. I was reminded of impulse buying a couple weeks ago when I took my son Malachi to the grocery store. We were checking out of the line, and he immediately sees this shiny piece of candy they conveniently put next to the grocery line, and then starts screaming and throwing a fit because he wants this little bit of candy. And I explained to him, Malachi, you don't eat candy, but that did not persuade him. My logic did absolutely no good. He wanted that piece of candy. And so I have a logical conversation of, you don't need this, we need to have a fr important priorities, no good whatsoever. But I held strong, he did not get the candy, and I started putting my things from the shopping basket onto the conveyor belt and realized, wait a minute, I just put the empty chicken tender wrapper onto the conveyor belt that I'd eaten in the store because I was hungry and just needed a snack and realized perhaps my son should be teaching me something else. Impulse buying is such an easy part of our world. And so there are a few suggestions for how to curb that tendency. The first, as I learned that day, don't go to the store hungry. It never ends well. You're always going to pass the chicken tenders and it's just going to be a bad scenario from there. The second is make a shopping list and stick to it. It's not the most, you know, it's not earth shattering. It's not mind blowing. It's not particularly complicated. It just takes a little bit of time before you go to the store to think through what do I have? What do I already have? What do I actually need at the store so you don't pass the sale bin and start adding extra things to your cart? And the last one is waiting 24 hours before you make that impulse buy. When you log on to that website and say, I really need such and such, you just sort of park it in the shopping basket and then give it a minute, sleep on it, think, do I really need that? And it's amazing how l fewer things you get and how much money you save by just that simple act of waiting and pushing the pause button. The second money waster is that of eating out. The average American family eats out four times a week, which is especially easy when you live on Amelia Island and there are a fantastic number of really good restaurants. And especially when you work at the Parton Center, it's really hard to motivate yourself to bring your lunch when you've got tasties and peppers and the picnic basket and a whole bunch of great places to eat. But all it takes is that simple act of planning ahead and how much just a Tupperware container of bringing your lunch at the end of the day could help save a lot of money at the end. Or at the end of a long day where you've been taking your kids from one place to another, it's a whole lot easier to just order Chinese food at the end of the day than to make a meal but planning ahead, having things in the fridge, making that little bit of work really can add thousands of dollars to your budget at the end of the year. The theme behind both of these suggestions is itself purpose and intentionality. When we put thought and effort into looking at where we spend our money, 
then we release ourselves from the grip of having to do things in the moment where we never make the best decisions. We release ourselves from having to just answer whatever the craving is and we allow ourselves to decide, this is what I want to do, rather than this is what I want to do now. A few chapters earlier in Luke, Jesus tells his disciples, where your treasure is, there your heart will lie also. Jesus here is talking about our priorities. Because when we look at our budget, when we look at how we spend our money, that is what reveals to us our true priorities. We may think we have it one way, but the money doesn't lie. And so in your bulletins, I invite you to take out the series of handouts. We're going to go through these tools briefly now. I want you just to turn the packet over to the budget worksheet. As we look through these headings, what is important to you? I want you to just jot down on the bottom of that form when you get home, what are the top two, three priorities in your life? What is important to you? And then allow the rest of the worksheet to be filtered through those things. The other side of the sheet has lists of goals. It invites you to start thinking about what are your financial goals for the next year. And it begins by asking that question, how would you define or describe your life's purpose? What is important to you and your family in the next year? And instead of just choosing, this is what I want to do, we make our decisions based on what's important to us. Intentionality, purpose, and let those be the driving factors of what we do. And then later in the worksheet, it has three different sets of goals. A short-term financial goal, a mid-range financial goal, and a long-term financial goal. And each one of us here has different sets of goals and financial situations. But as we're planning and thinking through those goals, my encouragement to you this morning is to make those goals not just about your finances. Make them about your values. Make them about your faith. And what would it look like to have a faith-filled financial goal? Where you free yourselves up to be able to be more generous to that cause that's important to you, to be able to support more of something, to perhaps even move yourself closer into the goal of tithing. Allow those goals to be faithful rather than just financial. And after you've worked through both of those questions, looked at your priorities, looked at your budget, then it's time to look at the rest of your life and see how does this work for me. And here again, Adam Hamilton has done a bit of research for us and has distilled his thoughts into six different key financial principles. These are the different combined wisdom of more financial planners than I personally know. But he solidifies these into six and I wanted to go over them with you briefly here. The first one is to pay your tithe and offering first. We've been talking through priorities. We've been talking through the importance of our budget. And it really does make a difference when our budget reflects who is most important in our life. This was a lesson that Jessica, my wife, taught me when we first got married and we're putting together our budget of putting our tithe at the top of the spreadsheet rather than at the bottom, making that list. It's a hard thing to remember to bring your checkbook. It's a hard thing to remember to pay your tithe each week or each month, which is why our family has found electronic giving to be so helpful because it allows us to keep our financial commitments to the church. And the side effect of that for me is that every month when I log on to our bank account to look at what our balances are, I immediately see this was my paycheck in, and then immediately right after that, this is the deduction that the church took. And it surprised me the first time I saw it. I was like, wait a minute. That's actually the priorities that I'm going for. I might not live that out every single day, but I can see the goal and the purpose and the intentionality behind it. And it really has made a significant difference. The second is to keep track of your budget and to keep, to create a budget and keep track of your expenses. 
Again, a simple act that makes a lot of difference. Because when you're not paying attention, money does tend to just go wherever money goes. But keeping a track of it helps you keep control. Third is to simplify your lifestyle and live below your means. For this one, I'm going to let you come back next week when Pastor Charlie describes this in a bit uh, more detail with a much better accent. So please come back and be, uh, be present in worship next week. Four is to establish an emergency fund. It is impossible to stay on track financially if you don't have a safety net underneath you. That's the reason so many people get into so much trouble. And so making that a priority is essential. And it's a daunting task to try to think about savings when you're drowning in debt. But let that be a goal. Start working on it now so that it will be there for you in the future. Five, pay off your credit cards and debt, and use debit cards for purchases. Credit is an easy thing, but it can be a dangerous thing. Thing. And so working on ways to pay that off and to clear yourself of that is essential. And if you are someone who struggles with that, next year our church will be te- leading through a Financial Peace University class by Dave Ramsey, which has been tried and true for so many families. Sarah Baldwin, who you saw in the video, she is one of the teachers for that class and is ha- has a tremendous passion for that. And so I encourage you to be on the lookout and to take that when you get the opportunity. And finally, practice long-term savings and investing habits. Savings is essential. But remember our priorities that we don't just save to accumulate wealth for ourselves. We save for intentional purposes. And when eventually you've saved enough that you have all that you need, then the beautiful thing is that you're able to actually give that away to others, to use that extra money to do a tremendous amount of good in our world. Practice savings and investing smartly and with a purpose. As I look through these lists, we've been going through a budgeting process uh, with our church as well. David mentioned our narrative budget, which hopefully all of you received in the mail. There are extra copies in the back if we uh, did not send you one, or if you might have lost it, the dog ate it, whatever happens uh, to your mail at your house. But the narrative budget is itself a list of what are the goals for our church? What are the initiatives we're wanting to do next year? What happens to the money after it leaves the offering plate on Sunday? How does it impact lives in our community? It's listed and described there, and I encourage you to take it home, to read it, to pray through it this week as you look at your commitments and think about what you want to pledge for the church for the next year. Because those pledges are essential for how we budget. Those pledges help us to see what can we afford to do next year? What can we do as a church for God's kingdom in 2019? And so as you look through those, as you pray pray through those, I want you to know that these principles are reflected in your church, in the finance committee, in the administrative staff, in the program staff as well. We look through how do we use that money? How Do we tithe first to the United Methodist Church in paying our apportionments 100%? How do we save for future capital maintenance needs, for future emergency needs if there's a hurricane? How do we do that? And we are working on funding each one of those accounts. How do we pay off our debt on our sanctuary renovation? And we thank so many of you who have helped contribute to that capital campaign and are paying it off with some really impressive numbers that David just shared with us. This is an exciting time to be a part of this church. And so as you're looking through your finances, as you're answering all of those questions, please do keep that in mind. Because over the next two weeks, we'll have an opportunity in worship to turn those pledge cards back in. We're giving you two weeks because sometimes it's easier when you have a little bit of extra time to consult with whoever you need to consult with uh, about those financial matters, to not make a hasty decision, but to make a prayerful decision for how you will use your money in the future. Looking at your priorities, where do those lie? What is essential for you and your family and for your goals? And then when you've decided that, when you've come to that conclusion, then to be able to celebrate how the church fits into that. 
as you bring your pledge card up and come and join with everyone else of what God is doing here at the church. The prodigal son reached his rock bottom in that pig farm in a far off country. And scripture says that he came to himself at the end. You see, the result of prodigal living, of just throwing our money around wistfully, the result is that we lose ourselves in the process. Our lives become all about our finances, all about our resources, all about how we get into debt or how we get out of debt. And that is not how God created us to be. The more we center our lives and control our finances, the more we are able to be the people God called us to be, to return home from the far off countries in which we find ourselves and enter into the loving embrace of the God who loves us, the God who cares for us, the God who wants us to be home. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, you know how easy it is for us to wander, for our priorities in this life to become disordered around ourselves, around our finances, and not around you. And so God, we pray that you would send your spirit of guidance to us to help us center our lives around your will and your desire. We pray that you would send your spirit of comfort on those who are struggling to make ends meet, who are drowning in debt and looking for a way out, that they would be able to take one step forward. God, help us as a church to be a place where we are a grace-filled family with one another that supports one another in the high moments and in the low moments so that all people can come to this place and feel your welcome embrace. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Please stand up and we're going to... Um